Hello everybody, today we're working on chapter 4. Um, if you were working on chapter 3 and following last week's videos, you guys hopefully heard the little tidbit that said that I uh, wasn't going to finish that stuff in class and uh, I'm going to be pointing you guys to the other chapter 3 videos that were recorded in previous years. They're so darn similar that you should be able to follow those if you really need support walking through those last chapter 3 exercises. But I wanted to keep us on pace for the semester and get us into chapter 4 and chapter 4 is where we start to shift gears a little bit. The first couple chapters that we've worked on where we really have kind of been putting stuff together, the pattern that the author has is to kind of show you how to do uh, some basic HTML stuff, get your CSS stuff in there, you've added some packages, you've worked with some of the tools, you've worked with design mode and, and coding mode and you've seen how the debugger works and how the built-in web server works and Hopefully you're getting to the point where you figured out how to correctly open a project and launch it and close it and save it and you know, all those things. Um, knowing how to work with the CSS in the environment certainly was very helpful. But now we're actually going to step into something that actually makes ASP.NET uh, unique you know, in comparison to other uh, coding approaches that you might use to put a website together. Um, one of the appeals of doing any sort of work where you're trying to get accelerated workflow, as, as I was the way I like to think about it, is to be able to build things that can be reused, right? And you can actually build things, uh, and if you guys have had your PHP class already, you guys would, will learn, for example, that if you create a menu bar, right, you can create that as a standalone page and then include that in your PHP, so you bring that component in each time. And when we're working with ASP.NET Server Controls, the topic for this chapter, it's kind of the same kind of thinking. However, right, so here's the however. There are server controls that are already built by Microsoft, and there's a whole bunch of them, right? And there are these tools that you can literally drag and drop in, or write a little snippet of ASP code, and it will come into your project. But there's also controls that you can custom create that are your own that might use some other server controls and then get saved as a separate type of file that we basically bring into the project. So for example, if you came up with a, uh, a little login box right, that works really well on this project, who's to say you can't use that same login on some other website? right? So you can save that piece of the site or piece of the page even as a control and then recall it whenever you wish. So that, that's kind of the, the basic gist of what we're doing here. So what this is really about is tools that are available to you and tools that you can customize and reuse. And I think that's really kind of uh, the fun of ASP.NET, especially when you learn about what some of these things can do for you. Uh, notice I have a little highlight here from the author and he says that the server controls are the workhorses of ASP.NET and I absolutely agree. In fact, when you're in, working in a Microsoft-centric environment, which many corporate environments are, are like that, you know, so for example, they'll have the, their email servers will be Microsoft Exchange. Uh, they'll may, they're maybe running SharePoint. They're, they're probably running Office or Office 365. And they probably have Microsoft databases all running on Windows servers. You know, that kind of an environment. Very, very common in corporate America. So when you're working in that kind of an environment, and then you can have server controls that are built right into the .NET environment that allow you to very simply say, okay, where's your, where's your database server? Here it is. Here's the connection. And then, uh, well, I can pull on the data grid, drop it on my page, and then I can take the information from the database and drop it right into my web page with a minimum of effort. And it's not really that minimal of an effort. You kind of have to know what you're doing. But it's a whole lot easier than coding the stuff from scratch. And that's kind of what this gives you. So if you can think to your PHP days where you guys would make a database connection and then all of a sudden you have to create the tables and you're pulling in the tables and you have to create like the HTML for the stuff to go into, it's challenging. It really is. Uh, and there's lots of room for mistakes. But if you have like these tools that are built in and you drag and drop them in and throw in a couple of columns and form a data link, wow, all of a sudden you got this like really powerful uh, tool set available to you. It's kind of like moving up from like a regular screwdriver to like a drill driver 
you know, with changeable attachments, all of a sudden you can do a whole lot more and a whole lot faster and better, right? Why would you ever use a screwdriver again, right? Well, the answer is so you don't strip the screw, if you guys want to know. <laughs> right. All right, that's me being silly. All right. All right, now, what the author does here in, in terms of a pattern is he's trying to show you a comparison now between how we might do things in old-fashioned HTML and then the, the ASP approach. So notice that this uh, following thing, uh, that, and we kind of did something like this earlier in the book, we put together an input, right? And the input is just a plain old text box. And notice that in the value field, we can pump contents right into the text box using plain text, and then you notice the ASP style tags right here embedded within here where we can call upon the time method that will put the time on the page, right? It's kind of embedded in there. And really what's happening here is we're running a piece of ASP code that's pulling a method in, right? So that, that's one way to do that. Now for that to happen, we need that server-side component running, right? Something to process the code and execute the action so that the web browser can receive it. Now, instead of using this type of, a, of an approach, ASP.NET actually has a whole bunch of different types of custom tags that it uses in lieu of using traditional HTML stuff. And this is not the type of stuff where I would, I would have you sit down and really memorize the ASP tag for like a text box. Most often what, what it is is what you would guess it would be called once you know what the control is called. But when we work in Visual Studio and we'll have a text box in, in the toolbox and we click and drag it into the project, it doesn't come in as HTML. It comes in as an ASP control. So whenever you see these ASP tags, like the, the text box one at the bottom here, we pull that control in and you know maybe when it runs through the server and everything is all said and done, it'll turn into the thing at the top of the page after the server processes it. But in terms of us building it, we just dragged and dropped it in. We didn't need to know the, the syntax for it. All we really have to know is it's a text box and it's got an ID. And what the ID is so that we can work with the object, okay? So a whole bunch of stuff. And you guys have already been doing it, probably not even uh, realizing it. All right. So in order for that text box now to be able to generate the time, and we kind of already did this, folks, you know, so this should be a repeat for you, right? Remember we did this? I hope. <laughs> can never really know that for sure. Um, so we, we put in this basically empty text box on the page. So we drop the control on the page. It's got an ID. And then in the code behind the page, we had some code that actually put the, the date and time or whatever, uh, convert it into a string and dropped it into the text box for us, right? A little bit different approach, but basically the same outcome, right? One way or the other, we're getting the time, the current time is getting printed on the page. The difference here is that we are using an ASP.NET control to do the work for us. All right, so let's try to do this in practice now. Um, go ahead and get everything opened up inside of Visual Studio. And since we're, we're in the process of opening up Visual Studio, before class started, we were talking about like the right way to open this up, uh, to open up one of the projects you're working on. Of course, the first thing that you should do is you should always do file management first. Um, and if you're following the pattern that I'm trying to push upon you, which is always to make incremental backups of your work as you go, uh, you should get something going that's starting to look like what I have here. It doesn't have to be the same. You can use your own naming conventions. But the point basically was is that I had a finished version of Chapter 3. I made a copy of it, and I'm setting it aside. I'm going to continue my work in the site folder, and if all goes well, great. At the end of the chapter, I'll save it as Chapter 4 complete. If I happen to screw up along the way so horribly that I have to go back to the beginning of Chapter 3, I can go... Uh, here, I don't have to go back all the way to the beginning of the whole process. But always make versions of your work. I did that preemptively before the video started, but you should be in that habit. All right. Now, to properly open up your project, you can do it a couple of different ways. 
So the one question I had in class before we started was, well, last time I closed my solution, it asked me to save a solution file, so I did, and then I just open up that solution file and it opens up just fine. Isn't that what you said, Brian? Right. And that is one approach. But if you've been following what I say versus what the author says, you might get a little bit of a contradiction. And I apologize if I don't always follow the author exactly, but um, my preference when I'm working on a simplistic website is just to open up the website. The only thing that's really different about that, folks, is the fact that we're just pointing to the folder, which is the root of the website. What some people have been doing in this process is sometimes their sites are a couple of folders deep, and sometimes that happens when you create solution files. Like you'll have a thing called site, and you open it up, and there's another site inside of it. And then I was looking at somebody else's, and there was like website inside of that. And you go into that folder, and there's another website. And you know, it's like which one do I open? Well, the one that you want to open is the one that takes you most directly to the folders that are inside the project. So in this case. I want to make sure I just open up my site folder and that my controls and demos and master pages and scripts and all that stuff is in the root of that folder. If you're opening it up one folder above and then you go to do a launch, you hit the play button, we've been finding that people are having problems opening up the page correctly. So what has been reported back to me from my students is that if you make sure you select the right folder and then choose open, then you won't have a problem launching it when it comes time to hit the play button. And that's really kind of what it's all about. All right, so I'm going to actually close all these uh, files that I have open here. Just so we start with a blank slate and can follow the instructions properly. And then I'm going to take my PDF book and move it off to the second screen like I normally do. And then I'll be uh, kind of reading from there. And I just want to set it up. And I'm, I'm trying to be extra careful today because the other night I recorded in my, my Web 2 class. And instead of recording my primary screen, I recorded my secondary screen. <sighs> not a good situation. But <laughs> I'm trying not to have that situation right now. So I'm just making sure of what's being recorded. All right. So we are at the bottom of page uh, 109, uh, working in the first Try It Out exercise in chapter four. So the first instruction was to open up uh, the project, which we did. And then uh, we are going to go to the demos folder and we're going to create a brand new web form inside the demos folder called controls demo ASPX. So let's go ahead and do a right click. Let's do an add and create a web form. They want us to call it controls demo ASPX. Now I'm going to go ahead and expand the demos folder and I do want to look at the ASPX file and I also want to make sure that it created a code behind file uh, with the .cs extension. They want us to be in design view so if you happen to be in, in source code mode please switch over to design view. And then uh, open up your toolbox. Uh, normally the toolbox will be collapsed like this in the sidebar. If you happen to not see it, remember you can always go to that view menu at the top. And then uh, about three quarters of the way down you'll find the toolbox which you can open up. Now because the toolbox now that it's open is kind of obscuring the page a little bit, I'm actually going to hit the little push pin here so that it stays in position on the side. They want us to drag that text box from the standard category of the toolbox. So if your toolbox opens up like this, expand standard, find text box, and drop it right into the div inside the box here on the design view. And you can see it did go ahead and create a text box for us. They also want us to add a button and a label control within the dash lines of the div tag. So let's go ahead and do that. So a button would go next. So I'm assuming it's going to go at the end, so I'm dragging it off to the right of the text box. And then they also want a label, which also I'm going to put after the button, once again, inside that same area. Don't worry about what they look like right now. 
not a big deal. We're, we're going to fix how they look. All right. Now, the other thing they want us to do now is they want us to put some text. This is step number three, about the top of page 110. It says, type the text, your name, in front of the text box and add a line break between the button and the label. All right. So right now, my cursor, if you guys can see it up on the screen, is after the label. And I know it's kind of hard to see, but you can see it flashing there. And then I'm going to arrow left with my keyboard. And you can see as I arrow left, first it highlighted the label. Now it's flashing in between button and label. Then I'm going to arrow left again. It highlights the button. Arrow left again. I'm in between the text box and the button. Very hard to see, but it is flashing there. Then arrow into the text box and arrow left again. So now I'm before the text box. Here's where I'm going to type your name. No, don't type your name. Type your name because you're putting this on the website for somebody. Right? And see, I'm getting into my habits here where I'm putting like a space, like like a colon and a space. And they just said, <laughs> they just said type your name. So that's all I'm doing. All right. I'm trying to take it carefully. Now, I'm also going to use my arrow key again and put my cursor in between the button and the label button. And what I want to do is I want to move that label down to the next line. So after I get that cursor in between those two things, I'm going to press enter to move label down one line. If you're successful at doing it, you should hypothetically have something that looks like figure 4.1 on page 110. Now I'm looking at that figure and I'm going to put off back up onto the screen here. And see, to me it looks like there is a space in between there. Don't you guys think? All right, I'm going to put a space in between mine then. I'm glad you guys are all in agreement. So I'm going to click over here, go right after the letter E, and hit the space bar. And you might not see it right away. There it is. All right. That looks a little better. All right, and I'm reading some of the tips the guy has about how to like maneuver around with the cursor. All right. Now they want us to go ahead and right-click the button control and then choose properties. Now one thing you should know is this is a handy way to get to the properties window for any object on the page. But do notice that because the button, if I arrow onto it and it's highlighted like this, the properties for the button do pop up here at the bottom. This properties panel, folks, if you're not familiar with Visual Studio, and, and I always take for granted that you guys are, and I realize that you're not necessarily. This is a panel that can be adjusted in size and shape. So I can move the divider bar and move it around a little bit um, or you know, change the size of what I'm seeing. I can also grab it. Like, well, I'm grabbing the title bar of it and I can pull it off and put it anywhere on the screen. In fact, it's not unusual for coders to like, take like little interfaces like this or the Solution Explorer and move them off to a second screen like I just did. And just have them off to the side. And then you can make it bigger, do whatever you want with it. Um, if you're curious about putting it back where it was, notice that like weird cross-shaped pattern that appears in the middle of the interface right now? That gives us the ability to start putting this in different locations. So notice where that's putting it? It's putting it on the side of the main panel. If you want to get it back into the side panel, notice over here, there's another side panel. So if I put it here, it'll drop. Oh, wait, that's not exactly what I want, is it? Right. So you might struggle a little bit with how to place it, but those little pallets will help you. Um, and one thing that you can do is if, if you do find a format that really does work for you, you can save it. Remember that you can do that. Uh, if you happen to screw things up royally and get into a panic, like I remember the first few times I did this and messed it up, Right. Remember, you can go to this Import Export Settings. I showed this to you back in the first week. And you can reset all your settings. If you want to save stuff, you can. I'm just going to say no. Um, switch to Web Development Mode. Click Finish. And Close. And then it should put everything back the way it should be. Right? If that's the way you want it. All right. It's highly customizable. Don't be afraid to experiment with it, but you have that safety net to go back to. 
All right, so now that we have the properties grid highlighted, um, okay, the, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out what they want us to change here. Okay, they're just showing us how to bring up the properties, okay. Um, but notice that uh, the one field that they have highlighted here is the text field, which controls what text appears on the button. So they want us to change that to submit information. All right, after you type that in, press enter to lock it in or click your mouse somewhere off of there. Uh, and then they also want you to set the ID. Now, depending on what format you are looking at your properties in or with, I guess maybe better English, um, You'll, you'll find this ID either all the way at the bottom or all the way at the top. I want to just make really clear to you guys that these property grids are really powerful little things. And anytime you have anything on a page, or even a page itself sometimes, every page will have a property, and a property is something you can adjust. So the way to kind of think of it is, um, you think of a button having all these capabilities, right? And one of those capabilities is the text on it, right? But there's also things like the, the font and the color and the size and the shape and the placement and all those things, folks, are properties. Um, so that's how you control those things is with this palette. But notice that the palette's got a couple uh, category buttons here um, for how you arrange the view of the items on the screen. The default for Visual Studio has always been the category view. So anything that's like related to the data or the layout will be grouped together. So height and width are grouped together. But sometimes, personally, I, depending on what kind of object I'm working with, I find this a more cumbersome way to get to the property I need. So I'll very often switch it to the second button, which is alphabetical. So it just lists all the properties alphabetically. So that way, if I, I, I know I'm looking for like font, it's under F, right? That's just me. And then when you switch to the alphabetical view, that ID comes up to the bottom. The book, which is assuming you're still in this mode, knows that the ID is all the way at the bottom. If you're in alphabetical mode and some people leave it there, then that ID is at the top. They want us to change that ID to say submit button. And one thing that you should learn as you're programming, that it's really good to name the objects on your page with names that you can make sense of later, right? You don't want to, like, call it, you know, button 364. Which button is that? Right? You don't want that. So that's why you don't want to call it button 1. In some cases, it doesn't matter because it might be the only button on your page. But I still think it's much more helpful when you're coding that you name things with a verbose fashion. All right, so we did that step. All right, now we're going to go to the text box. Once again, adjust the properties, and we're going to change the ID of the text box, and we know that's going to be at the top now, to say your name. Now, programming purists and people who are sticklers for convention and I'm going to tell you, and that's really up to you how you proceed. But in the programming world, you may have learned, if you had an intro to programming class, or if you worked with any GUI programming. So if you guys did like Java 2, for example, you guys are throwing text boxes on pages, you might have been taught that it's not a bad idea to, to do these little prefixes. So a lot of coders will, will use either full plain text prefixes or... Uh, these like three letter ones so that txt tells me right off the bat that it's a text box called your name as opposed to just your name. How you choose to do it that's up to you. I'm sticking with what the book's saying right now and I'm just calling it your name. Pressing enter to lock that in. Alright and then they want us to go to the label control so I'm going to the label and they want us to actually clear the text property, so they don't want any text in there at all. So we're just clearing it. And then notice how on the page here, 
label, instead of being in text now, has square brackets around it. So that means that if I click off of it, um, and if I ran the page, you wouldn't see anything there because we just deleted the text. It's still visible in design mode, though. I'm going to click back on the control, uh, and they want us to set the ID of this to say result. If you were trying to follow proper programming conventions, uh, some people would argue you should do LBL for label and then say result. Uh, I'm just following what the book said, monkey see, monkey do, and I'm going to type in result. Okay. Moving on to step number eight, top of page 111. Now they want us to do something uh, kind of interesting. They, they're going to have us actually double-click the button. Now, what double-clicking does is it launches us into the code view. This is not the only way to get here, right? Um, but by double-clicking the button itself, notice what it did is it created a method inside the class file named what? Same thing as the button. That's why it's good to name it first before you do this. So it says submit button, and then it writes a method that's going to respond to when the submit button is clicked, which is the default action for the button. So now I'm going to write code that's going to sit inside of here, and that code is available in your book. Just make sure you copy the right version of it. And right now I'm trying to get it so I can I can not type it in, but it looks like I'm going to type it in because my PDF reader is being a little resistant. But this is the code that we're adding. And then I just want you to pay attention as I'm typing in the code how Visual Studio kind of recommends things for me. In fact, I'm going to kind of back up here and start typing off from scratch because I'm going to type in R, and it knows right away that my project's got an item called result. And it narrows down on it immediately, so I don't even actually have to type the whole word. At this point, I can just either hit tab or entry. Tab is a better choice because it keeps you on the same line, though. Then I'm going to put in my dot, and then it wants text. I arrow down to text, hit tab. And then he wants us to say equals, and then quotes. Your name is... I was going to do an M&M &M joke, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, so now, I, now we're concatenating to that your name. What is your name? That's that text box we just created, right? So I'm going to say your name. That's what it's referring to. And the text from the your name box and a semicolon to close the statement. So here's what's going to happen. Pretty simple to predict, right? That button, once we click it, is going to take whatever people typed into your name and move it into the label. How clever is that, right? Pretty simple, but if you think about like what it would take in other languages to accomplish this, there's actually a little bit more work um, logistically that happens. So what we're doing here is we're grabbing a text property of one object on the page, and we're moving it to a different object. All right, so that, that's, that's pretty simple and, and fun. Now, just in case, and I, I, I should throw this in because sometimes people, when they create these projects, you know, we, we don't work with the back-end code right away, and it throws them a little bit. If you're seeing stuff that instead says, protected sub or n sub or uh, is using a different syntax, there's no curly brackets, you're working with Visual Basic, and you're in that case, this extension file here would be controlsdemoaspx.vb. And that's not the language that we've chosen to work with. It's not that you couldn't learn it. And actually, the syntax of the actual code is identical between VB and C Sharp, which is kind of interesting. But the infrastructure code, the stuff that holds the methods and the classes and all that is different. But we are working with C-sharp. All right, just in case. It is. In, uh, in, well, in VB, if you concatenate, it's an ampersand. But you notice how the, the, the remaining code is identical? It's just the stuff that encapsulated is, is different. All right. 
Uh, step number nine. It says save the changes to the page and open it in the browser by doing Control F5. So let's go ahead and uh, come over here and hit uh, save. And then you can do your Control F5 or I'm just going to hit play. Is that going to work? All right. Now notice how I'm getting this palette that's coming up now, right? This or this dialog, excuse me. And notice it says modify the web config file to enable debugging. However, the book says very explicitly to run Control F5, right? See which, where it says it right here, which means to run without debugging. Now remember what debugging does is it checks that backend code for syntax errors. Uh, we're following what the book is saying. Really, it doesn't matter which of these you choose, folks, but once you choose the top option, then you're kind of stuck, like, always using it, where sometimes you really don't need to use it. All right, so let's have some fun with this now that the page is running. My name is... Thank you very much. And then if you hit the Submit button... And then we got to do a waka, 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 right? So, okay. <laughs> a little record scratching to go in there. Nothing like the old white guy trying to sound very urban, right? Okay. <laughs> not, not funny at all. Okay. Uh, but that, that's a very simple little exercise that, that's pretty powerful, actually, in terms of what we just accomplished. Um, and also a, a real primitive example of working with uh, some controls that are e the equivalent of HTML form items. Now, the, the more interesting part here, to me, is this. Do a right-click and view source, which is what the book is having you do. And you guys, as you look at this, Please be mindful of the fact that a lot of this stuff, obviously, we didn't code. It was automatically generated by the .NET environment. That's pretty normal. Uh, but the stuff that we put together that was on the page, right? I mean, clearly, we didn't type any of this stuff. Somebody did that for us, some little magic Microsoft elf hiding inside your computer. <laughs> Somewhere inside there is a little guy working really hard. Uh, but we did create this stuff, the stuff that we, the div that was on the page and where we Put everything. And you can see the result of the tags that we created, even though we had ASP controls on the page. And maybe you don't even believe me on that, but if you looked at the code version of this page, you'll see it doesn't say input, type text. It says ASP text box, ASP button, ASP label, right? But when it runs through the server side uh, portion of it, the .NET engine runs and converts those ASP tags to their HTML equivalent so the browser can display them. The browser does not know how to display ASP tags. It knows how to display HTML. So there's a conversion that happens just like in PHP where your PHP code executes and then is potentially turned into HTML code or does some stuff in the backside that, that you're not seeing. We actually have a combination of those things happening here. Right? The output here that the user sees is just a text, right? So that label is really nothing more than a span tag with an ID. And then Slim Shady, I don't see the code that created Slim Shady. I'm not seeing this back end stuff, but this code is in the back end. So we load that page, the .NET environment goes, oh, here's the page. Let me find the HTML. That all looks great. Um, well, oh, I see you got you got a code behind page. Is there any code on there we need to run? There sure is. I'm running that code. It executes, and then it feeds into the ASPX page, which is a label, right? And then the server-side component runs that and generates your HTML. So you're not really writing that HTML, are you? Yeah, so that's kind of weird, right? And so like when I, I tell people like when they first start to program, it's like you learn HTML and then you learn how to write code that writes your HTML for you. They go like, what the heck are you talking about? I was here to learn how to make web pages. Yes, you are. <laughs> and this is one approach. So it's just a matter of understanding the mechanics behind it. And I think, at least from a conceptual standpoint, understanding how that works is a big help. It really is. All right, so go ahead and you can close your, your browser windows here. Um, and let's move on to, uh, to step number 10, uh, which was to do basically, 
type in your name, and then you look at the view source afterwards. Okay, I guess we did step number 10 then too, all at once. All right, so that, that finishes that try it out exercise, and we are now uh, moving on. Um, I think I did an okay job of explaining how it works, so I'm not going to necessarily read what the uh, instructor said there, or the author, excuse me. Um, but let's take a, a, an additional look here, as he says, at the server controls and how you define them on your pages. Now, I'm going to tell you, most modern developers these days, when they want to drop a control onto a page, and you can see, folks, that any of the stuff that are in these lists, are you noticing? Okay, standard. And a lot of stuff that, that are kind of normal for putting on web pages, like checkboxes, and well, there's a calendar one, uh, that kind of stuff. But there's also stuff that is uh, designed for data, for working with databases. Uh, there's stuff that's designed for doing validation. Right. You don't have to write all your validation from scratch, folks. Right. There's tools that help you. Uh, there's things that help you with building your navigation. How do you like that? Right. There's also components for creating logins and web parts, which are little mini web pages, and working with uh, dynamic AJAX ex extensions and other forms of dynamic data and then hey check it out you can even add regular old HTML if you really want to right so the question that you guys probably have is like could I just put in an HTML text box yep yeah, you can do that that's pretty easy to do um, but the ASP controls are more powerful because you, you can control them with that code on the back end and that's what it's all about having that programmatic control is why we choose, choose to work in this environment, to make it do far beyond what a regular web page can do. All right. So the, the author goes into uh, the fact that certain controls you're going to work with are going to have properties that are common to each other. You know, So like, for example, the color of the text, the foreground color, the background color, uh, if there's a hotkey associated with it, uh, can you apply CSS or font, etc.? I mean, you can read these yourself. Um, and these are properties that are common. But then there's other properties that are going to be specific to the type of control that you're adding. So, for example, if I put in a data grid view, that would be dependent on the fact that I had data to feed into it. So I'd have to have like a data source to provide. Okay. So uh, a text box doesn't need that because it just doesn't function that way. So that that's the kind of thing that might be unique. Uh, to something. Now what's fascinating is when you start to add a bunch of properties to an ASP control, notice that those things get embedded into the tag as attributes. Peculiar to ASP.net. All right. When I say that you have to memorize these things a very, from a very practical sense, folks, no. You know, if you're working with straight HTML, look at the equivalent text box with the same stuff applied to it and what happens to it. So some of those things turn into regular HTML attributes, and some things can only be controlled with CSS, so then they stick it in the style thing. Functionally, the same thing. Well, what happens conceptually is that ASP tag that you've created all that stuff inside of it by just simply dragging and dropping it onto your page and changing things in the properties window. When the person requests the page, the server grabs it, it runs the code, it runs the ASP tags, and turns it into that second one. That's what your browser sees. Interesting. I think it's really interesting stuff. You know? So um, now you might say with some of these things, does the CSS need to get embedded inside here? Well, if you're setting the properties for your text box inside the properties window, right, that's going to override your CSS, right, because it's going to go inline, and inline CSS supersedes global. So when I say that if you want to have <clears throat> a yellow border color, might you be better off putting that in your CSS? Yes, I think actually that's a better approach. But it just shows you that there's methods for making them in too. 
Now there are environments, I always tell people this when we're working with these kinds of higher level server side technologies, where you might be able, right, to go into a page and add a control and drop in some boxes, but that's all you have the ability to do. Like you might be locked out of the CSS, right? Because some designer spent the last six months tweaking that CSS to make it perfect. And the last thing they want is some like guys fresh out of gateway coming in and <laughs> blowing all their stuff away. So some, in some environments, it's very common to use inline styling and attributes like this to override the global stuff just very simply because that's the only access you have. And that happens in, in, in bigger projects and it happens in content management systems. So you take what you get um, and if you think it really needs to be a global style then you talk to the designer and you give them the code. Maybe you'll be lucky and you're that global designer. You don't know. Sometimes, you know, especially if you're starting out, it's not going to be that way. Just uh, interesting. All right. Now, <clears throat> I think the author is going exactly uh, where I was just going, right? Taking that CSS, moving it into CSS as, as opposed to putting it inside the tag. It's a, it is a wiser approach uh, and really kind of, you know, in terms of the, the semantic HTML that they really want us to follow, separation of concerns and all that, uh, it's, a, it's a better way. All right, so let's take, talk about the different types of controls that you might use. Uh, and what we saw already are what we call the, some of the more simple ones, you know, the, the, the ones that are really HTML equivalents. You know, text on a page, a text box, and a button. It doesn't really get much more basic than that. Those are really uh, core ones. Um, if you um, do exactly what I was just doing before, where I went through and I showed you all the stuff in the different uh, categories, um, you can get some pretty useful things. In fact, what I find really fascinating, and I didn't see that one in my toolbox, and that's because I have a, a fresh install here, a Visual Studio for all intents and purposes. It's only been on my machine for a few weeks. But notice that I don't have an HTML fragments one. Do you guys? Probably not. But what that will tell you that you can actually create stuff, and I think that might be one of the exercises that's coming up here, um, where if, if you write, let's say, some structure of HTML that you think is particularly clever or really cool or you put a lot of work into it, you can actually take that piece of HTML and save it as a fragment and then drop it into Visual Studio and it will appear on that separate panel so you can reuse it as many times as you want. Isn't that neat? So. Um, I, I think, I'm pretty sure he's got a little example of, of how to do that. Uh, he walks through and he, and he talks about some of the real common things that we're going to be using. Uh, there's list controls. So, for example, instead of us doing a UL or an OL, right, unordered or ordered list, if you use the ASP tag versions, um, you might have something like a drop-down list. That would be more like a select option list in HTML. Um, and then notice that, you know, list items are not LIs, but ASP list items. So, so it's kind of like interesting conventions that way. So let's go ahead and, and play with that particular control. And I'm going to tell you right up front here that we're going to be working here not only with just the control, but the quirks of how Visual Studio works. Okay? So there's, there's a little bit of a kind of a finesse that goes with it that is easy to miss if you don't either really carefully read the book or like have somebody show you, right? Because there's more than one way to accomplish things in, with these tools. All right. So let's go to the demos folder. I'm moving this off screen now. So right, or standard click on the demos folder. And then inside here, we're going to create a new web form. So I'm just going to do add web form. They would like us to call this listcontrols.aspx. Listcontrols.aspx. All right. I always like to check to see that code behind file is there in the right format. Uh, switch over to design view. 
and you'll see a, a blank page here. And then they want us to drag from the toolbox a, a drop-down list and put it uh, within the, the div up here. So right now it says body. Are you guys noticing that up at the top of mine? I know it's hard to see. But I'm going to actually click in there once so that I'm actually inside the box and inside the div because I want to make sure I land inside that div. So here I go. I'm going to grab the drop-down list and drop it in there. And then as it drops in, I want you guys to very carefully notice here uh, what Visual Studio is kind of doing for us. It, it's taking that thing, it's dropping it on the page, the object is highlighted. If you look at the bottom right corner of your screen, you can see the properties box come up. But then you also see this little pellet here, and, and I always forget what they, what they call them, and I'm, I'm looking... Um, I think they call it like a smart task panel. Thank you very much. That's what it's called officially by Microsoft. So, uh, and one thing that they're going to do here for us is they're going to kind of give us shortcuts in this panel, realizing if you're putting in an object like this, there's a, you're going to have stuff that's going to be in that list that drops down, right? So, do you want to put those in right away? I mean, it's kind of what that box is doing. So, um, all right, I'm, I'm, okay, in the case of the drop-down list, you get three options. The first one, I'm reading right from the book, folks, enables you to bind the control to a data source. So if I wanted, I could have that drop-down list populate from, let's say, database entries, right? Or a spreadsheet file, or an XML file, or a JSON file, or whatever it happens to be, okay, some sort of data source. All right. Uh, the next one allows you to do some stuff uh, manually, and then there's this checkbox here for enable auto postback. And that's kind of interesting. What the heck is a postback? Let's talk about that first. Now, if you're working in the field, right, or, folks, if you're sitting in a classroom, Right? And you got a computer sitting in front of you or a tablet or a phone, and your instructor says, What is a postback? Right? Don't just sit there, please. <laughs> Answer the question for yourself. I do this all the time. I'll be I'll be in a meeting and somebody will throw out an acronym or throw out some catchphrase. And, I, and you know, I, and I'll just say, I don't know what that is. Google, right? That's what it is. A postback is a name given to the process of submitting an ASP.NET page to the server for processing. So what it's saying there with enable auto postback is the moment that you hit the list and choose the thing in the list, the moment that you click on that thing, it automatically triggers the page. Right? Have you guys done that? And sometimes you go to a page with a drop down and you click the item and then you scroll down to find something else or type in a couple things. But I'm talking about the type where it's like you click the drop down list and you select Wisconsin and it pops you over to the Wisconsin page automatically. That's an auto post back. So that little box is, wait, where'd it go? Oh no, I broke it. No. You can trigger it again with that little arrow there, folks. You can always bring it back. So if you wanted your drop-down list to trigger some sort of postback or, or action immediately just by selecting it, you could select that box. And there's situations in which it makes sense and situations where it doesn't, right? So like one, one example of a situation that might make sense is if you had a multilingual website and it said choose your language. You know, English, French, or something, you know, and uh, you click it and the whole page ch just changes. So that, that's just kind of a, a primitive example. All right. Now, do you, do you get these little smart panels or whatever they're called with every tool? No, you do not. There's... Some tools that are more complicated than others, and those get these smart panels. Some of them don't. Some of them actually can get somewhat uh, complex. All right. But we have a couple of tasks that we want uh, to trigger here. 
And the one thing that they want us to do, so I'm at the top of page 119 now, the first small paragraph just above the image, it says, on the Smart Task panel, click the Edit Items link, and that's what we're going to do, and then it'll bring up this uh, interface here where we're going to do our work. All right. Now what we're going to do first is we're going to click the Add button on the left side, and notice that it automatically generates an item. Notice that the first one is just generically called the list item, but notice that there's a number in front of it. Notice what that number is. Zero. Why? Because computers start counting with zero, folks. It also gives you the immediate thought that this is an index value for an array item or an enumerated item, or whatever it happens to be, but it's an, it's a, it's an index value. All right. All right, so it says here, then in the properties grid on the right, enter C sharp for text, C sharp, and then press tab. And as the moment you press tab, it automatically pops you to the next field, but it, it's also populating C sharp into the value property as well, which is actually what you want. All right. So sometimes what this is telling you is that you can put a certain text in a drop-down drop list, but then that the value that's getting passed by that box is something different than the text. So, for example, if I were to click, um, let's say, um, WI in a list of states, or maybe I would click Wisconsin in a list of states, maybe the value that's actually getting passed to the database is WI, or vice versa. You know, so that, that's the thinking here. Uh, page 120, uh, step number five, uh, they want us to repeat this process a couple of times, and the next one they want us to call Visual Basic, hit tab, add another one, this one will be CSS. And then once you've got that done, go ahead and click OK. And then you'll see the panel, the smart panel is still open, but in the list now you can see the very first item appearing by default. If you want to jump over to the source code view, please do so and notice that we created this code with the use of that tool. A whole lot easier to use that tool than it is to type this stuff out manually. Not that it's really hard, but Remember, we're, we're using those tools to help us write the code, not worrying about writing the code ourselves. All right, step number six, it says in markup view, that's what we're in right now, right? The code view or source. Drag a checkbox list from the toolbox directly into the code window right after the drop-down list. So to, to me, that means right where my cursor is flashing. Now, this is curious, right, because so far we've been dragging controls into the visual view, right? You're like, cool, right? But you can drop it into the text view, too. Isn't that kind of interesting? So what do they want us to grab? A checkbox list. That's this one. I'm just going to drag it right after the drop-down list and let go. And yes, I put it on the same line, not where I really wanted it, but I can press Enter and move it down. Uh, and then if, if you want, I can expand my window here a little bit. But apparently it's not word wrapping today. So you just, so you can see the whole thing. Then it also wants us to take these three list items. Control C. Maybe add a line in here and paste those in. So wait, I can use the list box from the list items from one and put them in the, in the list of another? Yep, I can do that. All right, now they want us in step number eight to switch over to the design view. And then drag a button in to the right of the checkbox list control. So that would be over here to the right. I'm actually going to click over here to get my cursor flashing there. And let's grab that button and just drop it right there. Yep. 
Yeah, now you would think it would pop off to the right, right? Why would it end up below? Well, the easy answer to that basically is a list is basically a block level item in HTML. So it forces that object to sit one line below. Why the span tag or the label tag didn't do that before was just very simply because um, the span tag is an inline element and would, does not need to go to the next line. All right, once you got the button there, drag a label and drop it to the right of button. So let's do that. Notice how that one stays to the right. They're, they're telling us to move our cursor in between the two and add a little space. I'm going to put in a couple of spaces. Oh, and actually they don't want us to do spaces. They want us to press enter twice. Yes, sir. Right on it. Then uh, the last part of step number eight is to double click the button to open up the code page. And then step number nine, they give us the code to add. So I'm going to do this in pieces here, folks. Oops. And the code that they have in the book spans two pages. So I have to do two copy pastes. And I'm going to turn on word wrap. I hope you guys don't mind. Uh, just to remind you how to do that, you go to your tools menu, go to options. Uh, under uh, the left hand side here, you want to find your text editor entry, expand it. And I think I want to go to all languages. And then I want to turn the word wrap into a checkbox. And I do want to enable the glyphs. And I always like to have line numbers myself. All right. So that way when something drops down to the next line, it puts that little thing in there and you know that it's on the next line. All right. Next uh, piece of code that needs to be added is a for loop. So I'll drop that in, then we can talk a little bit about what the loop is doing. All right. So the first snippet of code, remember, it's going to react to the button. Now, did they tell us to name the button? They didn't, did they? Okay. I just wanted to be sure. All right. So let's see. Once you hit that button, what's going to happen is in the DDL, the drop-down list, you select it, and it'll grab whatever the selected value was, put in a line break, and then it's going to go through and check each of the items in the checkbox list, and if the selected item is found, then we're going to output what that item is. That's basically what's happening here. That's, that's the code in a nutshell. All right. Once you have that code typed in, um, we are going to go ahead and, and launch this. And it says save the changes to the page. So you can do control S. You can control S all your pages. And then if you're one of those people that hit save all, and actually I'm going to put in a change here, uh, that will do the same thing. But also hitting that play button saves all your work at the same time, folks. So just always keep that in mind. All right. Go ahead and hit play. Run without debugging at this point. And this is what I needed to see, right? Nope, wrong page. Right? What page do I need to see? List controls. So I'm going to actually right-click that one and do a view in browser. And there it is. So here's our drop-down list with the three options. Here's our checkbox list with the three options and a button. All right.
right? So if I come up here and I click Visual Basic, and then I come up here and hit CSS, or both, I guess I can click as many as I want, right? And then I click my button, it grabs the values that I selected from the drop-down list and the checkbox list and then grabs those values and displays them. All right. Now, uh, we are at a logical stopping point here, actually a little beyond it, so we are going to stop for a few minutes and take a break. Uh, and then I'll come around and help you if you have any issues. All right, the next uh, thing that we're going to be working on here, since it seems everybody in the classroom has been successful with the first uh, exercise, is we're uh, moving on to uh, the bottom of page 123 for the next Try It Out. Uh, and this is using the panel control. So once again, we're going to go to um, our Demos folder and right-click and add a new web form. And this one's going to be called containers.aspx. Uh, switch yourself over to Design View. Uh, I like to click in here first to make sure that I'm inside the div. And then they want us to drag a checkbox and a panel control from the toolbox onto the design surface. So let's start with the check, checkbox. Not the checkbox list, but just regular checkbox. And then I'm assuming right after, it doesn't really say, uh, grab a panel and then place it in there as well. All right. And hopefully you got those two things uh, in there. It says, give the checks checkbox control a meaningful description by setting its text property. Now we'll do that down here in the text box once it's highlighted. Um, to, to say show panel. So we type show panel. And then set the auto post back property, and that's a property inside here, to true. Now, with the little bit you learned about a post back, what's going to happen with an auto post back? Guess. What's when I do what? Right. So, as soon as I click that checkbox, it will immediately trigger an action to go with it. And in this case, we're making that true. Um, all right, and then uh, let's set the visible property of the panel. So what we want to do is actually come down here, and make sure the panel is selected, and you'll know that it is because it says ASP panel ID panel, and then set the visible property of the panel to false. So meaning, when the page loads up, whatever's inside that panel will be hidden. This is kind of a, a neat little uh, trick, too. So the page will first load, but the panel will be hidden. Okay, inside the, the panel control, type some text. For example, I am visible now. And now, what goes inside a panel? Anything you want to put inside of it. It's, kind of, it's just a container of sorts is really what it is. Um, and then if you switch to source code view, they say it should look something like this. And that looks pretty close to what's in the book. All right. Um, now, we, what we want to make sure that we do is that all these features are, are listed the same. Notice that the visible false is there, so it's not going to be visible on first load. We are probably going to need to be in this markup view for step number six, top of page 124. 
And then what we want to do is find the code for the checkbox. So that's this code. Position your cursor right before the closing forward slash. So right here. See what my mouse is. And type on, capital O, N, followed by control space. And what they're trying to do here is show you how to trigger the tools. So control space triggers the panel, it recognizes that you've already started typing on, and what we're looking for is the command, and actually it's an event handler. Notice the little uh, lightning bolt. Lightning bolts in indicate event handlers, right, that react to behaviors on the screen. And we're choosing one that says on check changed. So go ahead and click that. And then you can, you can press uh, tab is usually probably the best way to do it. And then type an equal sign. Notice it does double quotes automatically. And then we're going to type in. Where are we typing in? I'm trying to see how they want us to do here. Oh, so they want us to create new event. They actually want us to do that process. Okay, fine. Press tab. And notice what it's doing is just creating the name for something for us is basically what's happening automatically. Now, what's even more unique about this, and, and the reason the author is showing it to us this way, is we could have double-clicked the control, and it would have automatically added code to the code behind page. But notice that the, the way that I typed it in also added it here automatically because it's an event handler. So it's, it's attaching that event handler. So that, that's kind of the, the helpful little trick there. Now that you have that code stub in place, now you can add the code that's needed, which is this code. And notice what, what's happening is it's setting this equivalent to checkbox one checked. So if something is checked, what's its status, true or false? True. All right. So if the checkbox is checked and it's true, then the, pa the panel being visible equals true. So we click the box, the panel becomes visible. We unclick the box, the panel disappears. Pretty nifty. I like it. All right. So let's give this a shot. Go ahead and uh, click your Save All. Go ahead and uh, launch in your browser. It's probably not going to launch the right page, but hey, um, I'm running without debugging, by the way. I actually did launch the right page. How do you like that? So, not a really fancy page, but if I do click the button, and then I unclick it. Now, this is a pretty neat little trick, right? And this is basically the ASP.NET way to kind of accomplish this type of task. There are JavaScript ways to do this. There's CSS ways to do this. Uh, and sometimes you use a combination of technologies. But now you've got another arsenal or another tool for your arsenal of uh, web skills that you can use. All right. Let's go on to the next tried out. So we are now at... Uh, about the middle of page 126. And what we're going to do in this step is we're going to create what they call, uh, you know, the book is calling easy to use forms. And um, maybe easy to use, maybe not so easy to create. I'm not really sure. But what you're going to see here is kind of like a ramp up of this type of technology. Once again, it's, it's really kind of falls into the category of what I would call containers or, or panels. Um, so we want to keep that same page open. So we want to be on the containers ASPX page. 
and the, the author does want us to switch over to design view. So do that. It says remove the text, I am visible now. Yeah, that is a little boring. So let's get rid of that. And then drag a wizard control from the toolbox inside the panel. So notice right here in the standard section, there's a wizard control. And it says drag its right edge further to the right, increasing the total width to 500 pixels. So let's, I guess we have to put it in there first. So put it inside the panel. And then take this edge. So you see where my, my mouse is. And grab that little handle, the little square box there, and drag it. And you can see the pixel count as you, as you move. And they want us to make this 500 pixels wide because the author's got all the CSS already figured out. So don't mess with it, right? And boy, it's really hard to get it right to 500. I don't know if you guys are having that problem or not. Oh, 501, I think I'm at. All right. Well, <clears throat> you know how I'm going to fix that? I'm going to go to my source control, and I'm going to manually tweak that to 500 since I couldn't do it with my mouse. Open, I think I hit insert. Don't you just love when you do that? Change that cursor back to regular. I did it again. And that's because my num lock is off. Yes, it's fun to watch a teacher fumble. <laughs> All right. Go back to the graphical view and now click that little arrow, top right corner, to open up the panel. And then we're going to go ahead and which tool do they want us to use? The and choose add remove wizard steps. Okay, go ahead and click that. And notice that they already have placed in here a couple of steps, right? Well, what's the logic here? If you're adding a step-by-step -step wizard, right, I hope you have at least more than one step, right? I mean, it's step-by-step, -step, so at least two steps. That's kind of the thinking, I think, uh, which I guess makes sense. They want us to click the Add button to add a third step. All right, and I think what they want us to do next is go ahead and start naming these things. Um, so, uh, moving on to step number three, top of page 127. So, step one. And we want to change its title, right up at the top here, to About You. And then press Tab. Click on the next one down. Its title should be Favorite Language. And the third one should be called ready. It says step number four, it says change the step type of the second step, now called favorite language, to finish. So look for step type, and then once you click on that, you'll see the drop down appear here. Switch that over to finish. And the last step, its step type should be complete. The first one, if you're curious, should be just left at auto. So from a conceptual concept here, regardless of the number of steps we have, we have some steps that automatically will go to the next step. And then at some point we reach the end of the step so we're finished. And the reason we set the last one to complete is because that's what shows when you're all done. Because it's not really a step, it's just kind of like you're done. Okay, so that, that's the logic. Step number five, back to design view. Oh, we, we should probably click OK. 
to lock that all in. Um, click about you. So go ahead and click that. And it says here, click about you in the list at the left to make it the active step. How do I know it's the active step? Because it's bold, right? Um, and then grab, grab a label and a text box to the right side of the wizard. You need, need to, to drag them. See this like little box that's sitting up here in the corner? You need to drag those inside that box. That's, that's pretty critical. So uh, a label and then the text box is going to go after the label. So I'm, I'm arrowing to make sure that I'm on the right of it. And here goes the text box. All right, they do want us to set some properties here. So they want the text property of the label. So I'm coming back down here. Set to type your name. Change the ID of the text box. Do they want us to change the ID of the label? No. But they change the ID of the text box to your name. So let's do that. So that's complete. All right, and then it says you should look like Figure 14, thir or 413 on page 128, and mine does. Hopefully yours looks that way too. So step number six, bottom of page 127, says click favorite language. And I see how that became highlighted. And then uh, we want to make it active, which we just did. And here we're going to add a drop down list to the rectangle with a gray border. Right, so we want to do it inside that little box one more time. That's basically what, what's going on here. So drop down list goes right inside that box. Rename it by setting its ID. So I'm going to come over here to the panel, properties panel. And its ID should be favorite language. No spaces there. Then they want you to open up that smart panel again and add the same three items you added in the earlier try it out. So we're going to have a C Sharp, Visual Basic, and CSS. You guys remember how to do that? All right, so we can click Edit Items, Add C Sharp. Add Visual Basic and then add CSS. Just like that. And then go ahead and say OK. It does mention here that if you want, you could have copied those three list items like we did before and pasted them back in. It's just you know pretty quick to, to do it manually. Two. For the final step, switch to markup view. Now, now, I have a highlight here in my book, and I just want to show you that I'm highlighting it because it's one of those things that you know that's easy to gloss over. And it says, if you try to switch to the last step in design view, you may notice that the wizard disappears. Right? And good luck getting it back. Basically, is the point. So if that happens, switch to markup view, set active step index to zero again on the opening tag of the wizard, which forces the first step to display and show something. So we need to switch over to markup view. All right. And then notice here how we have these wizard steps, right? Here's one, the about you. Here's the favorite uh, language. 
and now we're on the last step, which is this one here. Inside the last wizard step, labeled ready, see, ready, drag a label control from the toolbox, and then change its ID to result. And you can see I changed it here and I changed it in the code at the same time, which is kind of cool. Right. And, and they're indicating here that I, I changed it here, but I could have just typed it in right here, same difference. Right? I, I would hope you guys would figure that out by this point. All right, step number eight, bottom of page 128. It says double-click the wizard in design view and add the following bolded code. All right. So now I'm double-clicking the wizard, and that creates this, this uh, code automatically. And notice that by double-clicking it, it assumes the default action is the Finish button. So when you're all done with the steps, this code will, will execute. All right, so with the C-sharp code, we have a couple things that we're going to do. So I'm grabbing it from the e-version of the book. And notice what we're doing here is it says um, the result text is going to say your name is whatever you typed in, right, because you've kind of done that already, and concatenated to it. And notice this is an append, so it's a plus equals, so it's going to leave what's there, so it's concatenating onto it a line break, so it's going to insert a line and then say your favorite language is whatever favorite language you chose. So instead of having like a drop down in check boxes, we're going to have you type in your name, you choose your favorite language, you hit the finish button, and it puts it up on the screen. So you see the steps that are happening? All right. It wants us to go back to design view now. So we got to go back to our page, make sure we're in design view, and then open the properties grid and make sure the active step index is set to zero. Now what this does is it makes sure that the first step is highlighted in the box. See how the About You is highlighted now? All right. So that's pretty critical. All right. So that's really important before we go launching this to make sure that it starts in the right place. Otherwise, where would it start? It would start on the second step. All right. So go ahead. Click Save All. Save all your work. And launch it in the browser. Run without debugging. And bring it up on the screen. First thing we need to do is be able to see the panel, right? So let's click the show panel. And now we're seeing all those options. So right now we're on the first step about you. So let's type in our name. Right? And then we do what? Click the next button. Hey, how did, where did that come from? We put it there, didn't we? We did. You guys remember that? All right. Um, or did we? I have you think about that for a second. Choose your favorite language. Not really, but that's what I put in. And then I'm going to click Finish. And it shows my name, and it shows my favorite language. All right, folks, hopefully you were successful with that little exercise. Um, it seems like everybody in the class here did pretty well with it. Um, and we have more work to do in Chapter 4. Folks, I, I hope to record the other two exercises in the chapter, uh, actually tomorrow, which will be a Saturday for me, uh, and get them posted for you uh, so you have a point of reference. Uh, I think that if you work with them really carefully, uh, you'll be fine. Uh, that wizard one is the trickiest one because of the, that step index thing, if you guys haven't discovered that already. But like I said, I'll, I'll try to record 
uh, the follow-up to this video tomorrow and post it over the weekend. Uh, if you really want to work ahead, you can always use last year's videos because they really they cover the same thing at this point. And they're really not that much different. All right. Thank you for a good class, and we'll see you next time.